preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, I'm very privileged to monitor this panel on women in biography tonight. I'm supposedly monitoring it. I don't expect to get a word in edgewise. Um, and of course, the, uh, the biographers with me uh, constitute a particular blessing. I'll introduce the three of them to you now at the beginning, and then ask each of them in the order of introduction, which is alphabetical, to speak for a short time. I hope that we can then exchange ideas between the four of us to be followed by questions from you in the audience, which I understand will be turned in in a written form. After introducing the three panelists, I'm going to mention some questions which we may want to consider in thinking about biographies of women. Deirdre Bayer is the author of the recent highly acclaimed biography of Simone de Beauvoir, and she won a National Book Award in 1981 for her biography of Samuel Beckett. She has been a literary journalist and a university professor, has received many fellowships and honors, and is now at work on two biographies of Colette and Anais Nin. Susan Quinn is the author of an award-winning biography of Karen Horney. Horney challenged Freud's views of women and was, in consequence, thrown out of some of the very best psychoanalytic associations. Uh, <laughs> Susan Quinn has also been a successful journalist and is now working on a biography of Marie Curie. Elizabeth Young Bruhl is the author of a recent biography of Anna Freud. She won a prize for an earlier biography of Hannah Arendt. She's a professor <clears throat> in the College of Letters at Wesleyan University and a member of the Gardner Seminar on Psychiatry and Humanities at Yale. Her new book, entitled Creative Characters will be published in the fall. And I think it worth mentioning here that all of these three biographies were edited by the same woman, Eileen Smith of Summit Books. <laughs> now, let me suggest some questions we might think about tonight. Gloria Steinem, my biographical subject, recommends outrageous acts against the patriarchy and the figure and law of the father. Karen Horney and Simone de Beauvoir committed sex acts, and Freud did not. <laughs> How objective ought the biographer to be in assessing patriarchal devotion and the woman subjects awareness or lack of awareness of herself as a woman in the patriarchy. A biography must, to some extent, be an imaginative reconstruction. To say it is objective truth is to see truth and fiction as opposites, which they are not. The established ideal in biography until quite recently has been objectivity, and devotion to truth. But such truth and such objectivity are just another phrase for an ideology so established that it appears not to be an ideology at all. How should biographers of women recognize this? Women's lives are different than men's, with different stages, different periods of rebellion and radicalism. Must not women's biography seek to discover new patterns in women's lives? To what extent should the biographer be present in the biography? Deirdre Bayer, for example, has discussed in the text, and particularly the end notes, her particular dilemma in dealing with Beauvoir. Elizabeth Young Bruel, on the other hand, is nowhere present in her biography of Anna Freud and not present either in her biography of Hannah Arendt, a woman who she knew. Ought a woman biographer to explain and examine her subject's political relations to other women, her support or refusal to support other women and the woman's movement of her time, if any? For example, a recent biography of Mary McCarthy simply states her lack of sympathy with feminism and lets it go at that. 
when the subject is a uniquely successful woman who did not bring other women along with her? Ought this attitude to be examined and explained? There is the question of female friendships and loves, often lost in, in our history, in our records, and we have lost, too, the quality of those friendships. Do they belong in what Adrienne Rich calls the lesbian continuum, that is, the entire range of women who find support and nurturing from other women and are not primarily male-identified? And how frightened are the subjects and the biographers of discussing lesbianism? Both Susan Quinn, in her forthcoming book, uh, on Marie Curie and Deirdre Baer in her past and future books have to worry about demythologizing their subjects. How can this be done without running the risk of seeming to betray one subject and robbing readers of her as a role model? There are other and better questions. Aging in women, relations of mothers and daughters, surely the most problematic relation in the world. Race, class, sexuality, attitudes toward marriage, above all a knowledge of the historical conditions surrounding the subject, particularly as they differ from today's standards and expectations. Asking questions is easy, and now we'll try for some answers. Deirdre, then Susan, then Elizabeth, which will we'll each speak for a short time, and then all of us will have a go. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I suppose I should probably begin my remarks tonight by telling you that 10 weeks ago on the smoothest sidewalk in New York, I tripped over my own foot and fell. And since then I've had this thing on my arm and the name is so uh, evocative and so uh, in tune with what I do professionally that I thought I'd tell you, this is an external fixation. <laughs> I'm getting rid of it Tuesday morning and I can't wait. <laughs> but at any rate, it does seem that when one writes biography, that is what one has, an external fixation. It's uh, a question of becoming involved with someone else's life to the extent of either identifying with them or, um, as some biographers had found, happily I'm not one of them, uh, becoming quite aghast at one subject, not liking one subject at all by the time the book is finished. I'm happy to say that each of the two books that I've written, I've ended with more respect for the subject than when I began each of them. And I really do hope that this is going to be true in the two books that I go on to write. Um, one thing uh, about writing the Simone de Beauvoir book, I was well aware of Carolyn's book about uh, um, uh, androgyny, and I was aware of her many essays and lectures and so on, and I considered her as a sort of, um, she didn't know this of course, uh, a kind of a guru, someone who was giving me permission to say what I said about women when I wrote the Simone de Beauvoir book, uh, someone who had given me permission to write about sexuality, to write about menstruation and menopause, to write about orgasm, things that really are important in a woman's life. Because, for example, if a woman spends five to seven days in bed every month, that's time that she's not writing. And so I thought it was important to ask Simone de Beauvoir if this you know, might have been the case with her. Um, it wasn't indeed. Um, the question of orgasm. Uh, she volunteered the information that she had her first at age 39. This after a 20 year long relationship with Nelson Algren and it happened with someone else. So rather than considering this as, uh, I'm sorry, did I say Nelson Algren? I meant Jean-Paul Sartre, sorry. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, um, al aliens beam things into my hook. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Every now and again, I, I lose it. But at any rate, um, 
uh, it, I thought it was important, someone who had created the myth of a perfect couple and yet who had had a significant emotional experience with someone else. Uh, so that these are the sorts of things that I put into the book, uh, took out of the book with each various um, rewriting of each chapter. And finally, fortunately for me, Carolyn's book on writing a woman's life appeared while my book was in the final stages of, of editing. And Carolyn said in that book that we had to examine women's lives in new and different ways from the lives of men because women lived different lives. We had to pay more attention to the emotional content of women's lives. And I felt that she had given me permission to say what I said, and I felt very good uh, then about including such uh, information uh, in my book. An interesting thing that has happened to me since the publication of the Simone de Beauvoir book is that I belong to um, a seminar at New York Institute, uh, New York University, uh, on biography. And many men in that seminar are distinguished biographers who have written major studies of men, some of them of women as well. And all of them, not all of them, some of them have said to me since the publication of my book, I wish I had paid more attention to the emotional content of my subject's life. I feel that when I write my next book, it won't be enough to say this man was married or this man had three children. I'll have to talk about the relationship of this man with his wife, his lovers, his children, so on and so forth. I will have to include in the life, life of the man that I am writing uh, more of the kind of information that feminist biographers and women biographers are using about women. So I think that, that one of the... Um, positive things that women writing about women will have done will be um, to introduce more of this kind of information in the lives of men. I also remember a newspaper uh, interviewer who said to me, I don't think you asked the same tough questions of Samuel Beckett that you asked of Simone de Beauvoir. And you know what? She was right. And I wonder now if I were to, oh, I know now that if I were to go back and uh, if Samuel Beckett were still alive, that I would ask him harder questions than I, that I, than I asked the first time around. I'm facing a very, very interesting experience now as I write the two books. Yes, I know that way lies madness, but I'm doing it. I'm writing two at the same time. Um, and I'm facing a very interesting experience now because both of these subjects are dead. Uh, and very few people are, are still alive in the case of Colette, who knew them, knew Colette, and then they only knew her as an elderly woman. Um, with uh, Anais Nin, fortunately, there are many people who knew her and knew her well, so I'm, I'm benefiting from their memories of her, um, their knowledge of her, their experiences with her. But I don't have this experience. I, um, I didn't ever see either of those two women when they were alive and didn't know them, and so um, I'm, in a sense, venturing out into the great unknown with these two books for me, because I don't have them to argue against, uh, to contradict, to, to argue for their version of their lives against my version of their lives. And um, I'm, um, I'm having some interesting thoughts um, as I begin the process of writing uh, much of my research is done for these two books, uh, so I'm getting ready to start writing, and I'm having some interesting thoughts about how I'm going to make them come alive on my pages. So that's it for me. <laughs> Susan, Susan, Quinn. Um, Susan Quinn. <laughs> I uh, just wanted to say about Dee's biography of Simone de Beauvoir that I think one of the things that creates a fascinating tension in the book is the tension between her ideology and the messiness of life and of her life in particular. And uh, it's a tension that uh, I think every biographer deals with. And it's also a tension in the biographer, I think, between one's feminism and one's femaleness, you know, which are not the same. And the question of which Carolyn raised at the beginning of how much one should be an advocate 
uh, in a biography is a real important question. I feel it's important in general um, to to not to not be, and uh, but at the same time, I feel the biographer's presence in the biography is extremely important, um, and uh, for other reasons, uh, I think that uh, while, I'll just throw this out as an idea, while I, I consider myself a feminist, I wouldn't particularly like a book of mine to be seen as a feminist biography, because I think it might be limiting in the way, in, in who would read it and how, it, how it, in, in the sense, a reader might, the, the problem with having a position as a biographer within the biography is that it tends to not give the reader enough space and it's very important that there are three people involved in the process of the reading of a biography. There's the subject, there's the biographer, and there's the reader. And the reader needs to feel that there's some room to maneuver. So uh, the reader needs to feel that he or she can make her own judgments, as it were, about the life. Um, and, uh, so and so I would suggest that uh, that's, that's a, an issue in attention, and that even when one is a feminist, one needs to be um, sensitive to the ways in which the subject may not fit into one's expectations, in fact, is likely not to. Um, I talk a little about a difference between the two biographies that I've worked on. I've, in many ways, my motivations for writing about Karen Horney were perhaps classic feminist ones. Um, I read one of her essays and uh, was absolutely stunned by her ideas and decided um, right away that I wanted to write her biography. And throughout the project, I had a sense of mission about her, a sense that she wasn't appreciated, that she wasn't understood, that her story hadn't been told, and that I was telling it really well for the first time. And uh, that's a wonderful motivator, and it's an exciting feeling. There's a moment when you crash, however, because you discover that your subject doesn't live up to your expectations. And the idealization, uh, you have to give it up. And that happened with Karen Horney at the point where I discovered she'd had an affair with one of her patients, uh, something that really upset me. For a long time, I didn't even want to put it in the book. And then I sort of dropped it in. And, left it. <laughs> it. Took me a long time to really try to deal with it and what that meant about her. But this time, I'm writing a biography of Marie Curie, a woman who has been very much idealized, in fact, who's an icon, almost a secular saint. And I have an interesting uh, history with this subject um, that relates to Carolyn's reference to mothers and daughters. It's one that I didn't quite really figure out until I was walking in Paris one day and thinking, thinking about Marie Curie. <clears throat> As a girl, like many girls, um, my mother handed me Madame Curie, the biography written by Eve Curie. Um, and it was presented to me, I think, at the time as a portrait of a pretty much ideal woman, which it was. And um, like a lot of women, I've since learned many, many, I'm sure in this room, that book, Madame Curie by Eve Curie, uh, was in a very important formative book. I, in fact, quoted from the book at my high school graduation. Uh, and I suddenly realized when I was in Paris that, that what I was doing, I was in the process of rewriting this life and making Marie Curie into a real person. Um, in, the, in Madame Curie, she's very much of an idealized figure. In fact, she's, and, and because that book was, was published in 1937, she, uh, th four years after Marie Curie's death, three years, um, that book pretty much preempted the field. And it is the book that has set our view of Marie Curie. And I think you would probably all agree with me that she's very wonderful, but she's also someone you can't quite take seriously. She's sort of a 16-year-old girl's ideal of a person. And it's interesting, too, that for the most part, we call her Madame Curie. That's because of that book, which is, after all, means Mrs. Curie. She had a first name. She was Marie Curie. Um, and many times when I say that, people do a double take, because they really think of her as Madame Curie. 
Um, and I think I'm in the process of trying to discover a complicated, suffering, flawed human being uh, in, uh, in Marie Curie. And uh, I, I think I have discovered her, <laughs> in fact. Uh, but but it's, um, it's an interesting process because it's, it's exactly the reverse in some ways of the first time around. And it raises a lot of question about why we write biographies. And it also means that in some ways it's a biography, biography about biography and about the biographical process, which uh, I find very interesting. Um, I think maybe I'll just leave it there and turn it over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you. I think that you are so right that the conditions uh, under which we write uh, biographies, and particularly biographies of women, have changed so dramatically uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so. I myself, when I think of the two biographies that I've written, uh, I started one in 1976 when I was 29 years old, and uh, I didn't know anything. And uh, my biography of, of Hannah Arendt, uh, when I look at it in retrospect, was a great struggle uh, in me, not, not only with the difficulty of, of writing a biography about uh, a woman who had been my teacher and my mentor and my great ideal, but also I spent a great deal of time while I was writing that book trying to decide if it was all right for a shiksa to write a biography of a Jew. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I put much more emphasis in my own mind uh, on, the, on uh, Hannah Arendt's uh, identity as a Jew which was certainly in accord with how she thought about herself, than on her identity as a woman, about which she didn't seem to have thought a great deal uh, at all, at least not theoretically, which is how she thought about most everything uh, else. And uh, it's very, very difficult uh, to raise the kinds of questions which you could ask uh, Simone de Beauvoir uh, about her sexuality, uh, about intimate matters of all sorts with somebody who first of all is dead and who secondly <laughs> uh, secondly w was uh, extraordinarily uh, reticent and I don't think that there's uh, anybody in her life with whom she talked who could have given you <laughs> answers to, to uh, such questions. I've had the great uh, uh, strangeness now of writing two biographies of two uh, German Jewish women of the similar vintage and generation uh, who couldn't only compete with each other for their desire to be private and uh, to be reticent and uh, to stay out of the public domain and to thwart their biographer and, <laughs> and, and to keep their secrets and to make sure that no one ever found out their innermost uh, thoughts. This this makes for a very difficult uh, uh, difficult access of the of the biographer. It also. I think instills uh, in a biographer a kind of a um, an ongoing struggle with issues of privacy, which perhaps uh, with subjects who are not so uh, guarding of their own privacy, you don't have to uh, to undertake. Each time uh, something uh, is revealed in a biography of somebody who spent a great deal of their life covering their tracks and and being careful about uh, their private life, each time you decide to uh, breach that uh, uh, self-regard of theirs, you have to answer all kinds of questions to yourself about whether you've uh, uh, ethical questions <laughs> about what you are what you are doing. I mean, it's hard enough to raise feminist questions, of <laughs> but these ethical questions are very, very, very difficult. Uh, I think it's uh, 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 was very funny to me when I published my amusing uh, funny when I published my biography of Anna Freud. Uh, which has quite a long, I think probably the longest in any uh, published biography discussion of masturbation that exists. And uh, uh, this uh, caused among Anna Freud's uh, associates and friends uh, a tremendous uh, collective frisson. All these 
uh, psychoanalysts were absolutely scandalized <laughs> that that masturbation should be discussed in a bi in a biography, and uh, I pointed out in my own defense that it had been uh, discussed uh, by Anna Freud in many essays and by Anna Freud in her in her letters, which were after all part of the Anna Freud estate. But this meant nothing. Uh, uh, so there are still is a are great uh, taboos that surround all kind of topics like this, but it definitely is the case that uh, to discuss these kinds of intimate affairs now is very, very much easier than it was uh, 20 years ago and uh, is much more uh, par for the course in, in uh, biographies. I wanted to address, um, you remarked provocatively, uh, that Elizabeth Youngbrill didn't appear in Elizabeth Youngbrill's uh, uh, biographies. And uh, that's, a, that's an interesting business about this subjectivity. I mean, you demurred in the, in the preface to your Simone de Beauvoir about putting yourself uh, in the biography in a certain uh, way too. There's a very wide spectrum of opinion uh, about how much the biographer uh, feminist or not, uh, should be in the biography. I don't subscribe to the present yourself in the preface with your heart on your sleeve and say how you loved her or didn't uh, and what the course of your affair with her was and, and so forth. I don't uh, subscribe to that uh, idea at all. But I, on the other hand, do think that I'm very much in my biographies. And uh, I like my readers to to uh, feel my presence in the biography in a quite a different way, not as a personality uh, or as a person who in some way tells her story in the book. But I think that the reader, and I couldn't agree with you more, Susan, that this triangle between the, the writer, the subject, and the reader is the essence of the biography business, uh, really different than many other genres, how important this uh, is. I always feel that my reader should feel me in every paragraph, making my decisions, setting things up this way and not that way. They should feel my regard for my subject. They should feel my regard for all of the details of her life. They should feel my tenderness uh, for her when I feel that. They should feel my distance when I feel that, but that it never should be spoken. It should be in the tone of, of the book. And uh, that way, you don't preempt the reader's relationship to the book, but you give the reader the feeling that she goes along with you uh, and that uh, you do this piece of the road together, uh, the writer and the reader. I think it's a kind of, I like to think of all, that biography is a genre in which the biographer can offer the reader a kind of companionship in the discovery of a life so that there can be a feeling of, of um, discussion between the reader and the, and the biographer, uh, even if that has to only take place in the reader's mind while the reader's reading, it takes place in the writer's mind while the writer's writing. And I think that's a very feminist approach uh, to biography. It's companionable. And it's not, uh, it's not, I'm the authority, and I'll tell you about this life, and please get it straight, and uh, <laughs> then, you know, and then you'll be able to quote it just so like this, and I own this life, and it's my turf, and there are six other biographies, and mine's the best, and the longest, and the biggest, and the most uh, uh, kind of uh, kind of thing. This sort of locker room talk about uh, about. Uh, about uh, subjects uh, that doesn't go on in most feminist uh, biographies. They have a very different uh, quality. So, so I agree with you, Susan, that I don't set out to write a feminist book, but when you are a feminist, you write a feminist book, even if, if you don't have a manifesto. You know, so, but so, you know. I'd like to add one thing to that, and that is that I think the ways in which a feminist biography are different, and I think there are many ways, and one is dealing with the emotional life, and another, and a part of that is making what has been invisible visible mm. in the life, not just the emotional life. Marie Curie as a mother to her children, for instance, which is one of the things that I, I hope to make more visible, but also, for instance, asking 
the questions that haven't been asked. How, what did it mean to be a woman in medical school in Freiburg in 1906? How many women were there? What was the atmosphere? You know, and, and, and of course, one discovers there was a lot of hostility, and it becomes very, a very important part of what one knows about that experience. So I think that that's maybe the most important thing that a feminist does differently, and that is um, that a feminist um, collects evidence differently. Yeah. Yeah. You do pay attention to different things. I mean, you pointed out in an article uh, that I read a while ago that, that it's very funny to read the vast collection of biographies of, of uh, Sigmund Freud. I mean, this is shelves and shelves of books we're talking about. And uh, to have it noted that Sigmund Freud had six children and one of them became a psychoanalyst. But there's really basically no discussion of those children. Mm -hmm. It's as though he had no relationship with those children. Mm -hmm. Or uh, more recently, people have looked at the relationship between Sigmund Freud and Anna Freud, now that there's a bit more material available to do that. But only that one gets looked at and all the rest of these five children just disappear, mm -hmm. <laughs> are married, have children, and disappear from the book. Uh, and that's a, that's a kind of a, no, a notion that a man like Sigmund Freud, of course, didn't learn anything from his children uh, or have any relationship with them. And mm -hmm. that's, I mean, the, the feminist uh, atmosphere should have penetrated into that particular piece of prejudice, but, uh, but hasn't very much. Yeah. I'm, I'm always interested in the question of work, how you write about women's work and how mm. you incorporate that into... Uh, any life of a woman, uh, when and how did they uh, do their writing? Uh, I'm particularly interested in Susan's work. Uh, how will you describe work? What words will you use to make science accessible to the average lay reader? Uh, I think that's uh, something that I'm going to be very interested in. When I read the biography of an artist, I want to see what are the words that the biographer used to describe uh, a nonverbal task, the mm. creation of a painting, say. Um, how will you uh, incorporate uh, the woman uh, artist, writer, scientist, whatever, how will you incorporate the facts of daily life and the human relationships, and how will you weave that in and around the question of work? Um, it, it, uh, in, in a lot of biographies of women before uh, the so-called feminist wave of biography, the contemporary feminist wave, um, woman's work was um, reminiscent to me at any rate of those pictures of um, the happy housewife who had the beautiful little apron and with one pot she's stirring some marvelous souffle and juggling the baby with the other and, and dabbing perfume behind her ears for when her husband came home. This very uh, non-feminist image always came into my mind because it seemed that uh, a woman president, a woman writer, a woman artist was portrayed in, in very much those kinds of terms, this is if the work happened off the stage of the life. And one of the things that interests me now in um, contemporary biography is the way we, we've moved work center stage, the idea of work, and we're trying to write about it and portray it as both necessary and integral to a woman's uh, being. Uh, I had hoped uh, in um, commenting about one's being in a biography to be provocative, and I clearly <laughs> succeeded, um, and I'm glad I did. And I wonder if I could go on and just, um, uh, if we could just uh, fight it out a minute more. <laughs> um, but with both you and, um, and Susan Quinn, you mention this neat um, triangle of the subject, the reader, and the writer. And I have a feeling that is the way biographies have been described ever since they've been written. And if we want to talk about why women's biographies are different, um, I think that's all we mean when we say we're being feminist. Uh, we mean that we're turning the world slightly to look at it with a woman at its center. And that we are questioning the structures which tried to influence, did influence, or failed to influence her life. That's all feminist means. <laughs> and if you don't say to the reader that I feel, if the reader doesn't know you're beginning there, they are not aware, for example, why you make certain decisions. Um, and I think we have to distinguish women's biography 
from other biographies because there have been no biographies of women. Women's work, women's everything. The very fact that Susan Quinn used the phrase about de Beauvoir of her messy, complex life. <laughs> I'm not convinced it was any messier <laughs> or any more complex, certainly not than Sartre's. Um, <laughs> I think we just tend to think of women's lives as having a neatness, which in fact uh, they don't. I'm very fond of Beauvoir's life because she's the only woman I know who wrote a book and didn't read it for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I really would like to challenge you, um, or all of us, on this subject. For some reason, and certainly in the academy where we all hang out or have hung out, to be feminist is to be ideological. But to be teaching Plato isn't. Um, to, be, uh, to be just uh, the way we've always been is just as ideological, and therefore, I think, and I'd like to suggest that people now who write on subjects, who turn out to be, for example, racist or homophobic or anti-Semitic, force themselves, as Clark has done in his recent biography of Lippmann, to face that question. And that is, I think, what we are talking about, personally to face it. I was shocked, he said, to discover this. Hmm. So um, I think what you're saying is neat, but... Um, I feel that, um, that I do need the biographer a little placed. Um, do you want to answer that in any uh, mildly violent way? <laughs> mildly violent, no. Uh, I, I, I do uh, disagree with you. <laughs> and uh, I think that, uh, that there's been a, a, great, uh, um, a great deal learned from the, from the that can be learned from the tendency, though not not all uh, people, and certainly we don't, uh, in, to different degrees, to subscribe to it. That the the preface, for example, should be the place where you where you state your uh, piece and in some ways tell the story of your relationship uh, uh, to the subject. I don't uh, subscribe to that uh, view because I think it gets it. It, it accomplishes what you say on the one hand. Uh, it puts the, the reader's cards, uh, the, the writer's cards on the table for the, for the reader to read. On the other hand, it puts the writer too much, to, to my view, there in front of the reader uh, and takes away in that regard some of the, re the reader's approach to the, to the subject. And uh, that's, that's, I'm no uh, advocate of objectivity or the myth of, of objectivity. But I nonetheless do feel that the that the reader should uh, should have a kind of of uh, path with the subject uh, that doesn't uh, have the have the biographer standing there on it, and lets the reader have those uh, responses more more clearly. But it's a, certainly a very debatable thing, and I can imagine myself writing another life in which I had a stronger. Uh, um, uh, uh, to me, more important story to tell about my relationship to the subject in which I would just uh, go against what I just said. <laughs> if, I, if I thought the reader had to know something about my relationship with the subject in order to appreciate the book or understand the book or judge the book, I would tell it. I just haven't had that. Uh, well, a, a couple things. First of all, I, I mentioned her messy, complex life uh, not uh, as a put down, really, but in contrast to her ideology, her life was not uh, didn't follow the, the ideals, certainly, of uh, uh, the second sex. And, um, but uh, I also don't agree. I, I feel that um, that um, we shouldn't be talking about woman's biography as a genre apart. Um, I think there's a danger that we m may um, unnecessarily divide ourselves from uh, fellow biographers. I think it is a genre, whether you're writing about a man oh, or a woman. Susan, let me intrude here to say I did not suggest that women's biographies were a genre apart. I suggest perhaps that feminist biographies uh -huh. are. Well, and by that I mean one, and men can write, and indeed did write before women did, feminist mm -hmm, biographies. Mm -hmm, yeah. They were likelier than women to see women in the center of their own lives. Mm -hmm. uh, that is all I, mm -hmm. I do well, want to 
it depends. Yes, it depends on how we define feminist biography. Is it, if it's simply putting the woman at the center and, uh, as I say, sifting the evidence differently and having different criteria for what we consider evidence or information that's important about a life, then I think we are writing feminist biographies. And I think I wrote one and want to write another one. <laughs> um, uh, but I. I, I think in terms of, of, of the, uh, I agree with Elizabeth about um, uh, needing to declare a position before the biography even starts. And I think that a good biography integrates the biographer's voice into the telling of the story in such a way that by the end, the reader knows not just the subject, but also the biographer and knows a lot about her. Uh, about her and, and what her values are, mm. and that one doesn't need to state them. And in fact, it's better if one doesn't, because I do think they get in the way. Well, you know, I've noticed too that, uh, that people have an autobiographical impulse after the writing oh, of the biography, absolutely. which often takes another form. You yes, know, like they write essays essay. about it, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, which we've all done, I think. Uh, uh, Deidre, let's hear you. Uh, well, a couple of things here. Uh, the first is that um, I came right out in my book and said, this is a feminist biography. And the reason I did it was because it was, um, by the time we got it edited down into manageable form, it was over 700 pages. And I felt the necessity to let the reader know what I had done. I felt the necessity to let the reader know that um, I'm, I'm not uh, bilingual by birth in French. It was a language that I learned. It was a culture that I acquired, uh, that I had to educate myself in French history, French politics, French culture and society, that I had to learn about French education for women, and that the book that I wrote crossed all sorts of traditional boundaries, that it was both literary theory as well as cultural history and intellectual history and political history. And I wanted the reader to know that I was bringing this mix uh, to bear on this woman's life. And then when I started to write the book, I felt I have to break down form. I have to write a modern book. I can't do what Edmund Goss said way back in 1911, that you begin at the beginning and you end at the end, because what more is biography that someone's life and the progression, linear progression, until death? And I uh, knew about all these other remarks that people had made about biography that was the halfway house between literature and history uh, and uh, so on. And uh, I, I thought, oh, I can't do this. I have to present this material in a new and interesting form. I'm going to begin with the chapter on the second sex. This is the most important achievement of this woman's life. And then I'll backtrack and I'll fade in and out with my own voice and snippets of our conversations, which I found incredibly fascinating, and my reader will find these as fascinating as I did. I had the good fortune to talk to Simone de Beauvoir uh, for five years until she died, and to argue against her version of her life, and to have her argue against my version of her life. And so I thought, this is information that my reader needs to know. I've written a new kind of biography here, and I have to let the reader know this. So. I would put these marvelously witty and sparkling passages of our conversation into one of the earlier drafts of the book, and I gave it to my editor, a very sensible woman. And she said, when you say, oh, come on now, did it really happen that way? That's marvelous. But on the page, it looks like you're some sort of a blue stocking school marmish scold who's saying, oh, come on now, did it really happen that way? <laughs> You know, you're giving too much leeway to your reader. What is your reader going to think? You have to make it uh, more, um, uh, not only accessible to the reader, but, but more definitive. You, in other words, you can't deconstruct this text and let your reader think anything your reader wants. You have to set up parameters and you have to set up certain boundaries. And so what I did with those conversations, finally, those passages uh, that I worried about the type coming from a, a family of graphic designers. I worried about how we set off that type on the page <laughs> as well as what the words say. Uh, and finally I decided those words don't belong in the book at all. They belong in the notes. And, I, and the way I wrote that book was in effect to write two books. The first part of the book was, and indeed my version of Simone de Beauvoir's life, 
which I wrote, keeping in mind Virginia Woolf's adage that each of us has as many as a thousand selves and happy the biographer who captures six or seven of them. And then in the notes, I have almost what amounts to a second book. It's my dialogues with Simone de Beauvoir, her versions of her own reality when they differ from mine or even when they support mine or corroborate mine, the versions of her reality offered by other people, her friends and professional associates. And so there's sort of a multi-layered book. Now, the last time I was with Simone de Beauvoir, she died quite unexpectedly. I was with her in March of 1976, and she died three weeks later in April. And I remember that March afternoon thinking, this is so marvelous. This woman whom I had thought of for a number of years as being aging and ill and who possibly wouldn't live to see the end of my book will indeed look, live, live. She looks so marvelously healthy. She's so robust and our dialogue is so interesting to me at any rate. And so I found, my, I found myself telling her about the way I was then structuring the book, this last published version of the book. And I remember she said, well, you have to let me in there too. You have to let me argue for or against you. You have to put in what I think about what you're writing. And I said, that's a very good idea. I, who am seeking new form, I found it. We'll have here the biographer Bear's version of the autobiographer Simone de Beauvoir's version of her own biography. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, this is wonderful. What we have here is a hall of mirrors. We have me reflected in so many different ways. Well, I left that meeting with her just filled with the sense that, that I was indeed breaking down the barriers, the traditional constraints of beginning at the beginning and ending at the end. Um, and the minute I got out on the street, I thought, oh God, what do I do now? How do I do this? It's another 10 years before I'll get all of this incorporated into a book which will be of unmanageable size and it will never be published and no one will read it. And um, unfortunately, she died three weeks later because I never had to face the possibility of what I've been calling since then, a kind of shorthand term, the breakdown of form. Um, how do we break down traditional biographical form? Uh, are, we, are we trying to do it uh, for its own sake? Uh, is it necessary? Um, will it be useful? Do we then have to say it will work in the life of A, but it certainly won't work in B or C? Um, of course, we come down to the final point, which is that it's an individual matter for each individual biography. But again, the question of form, the question of methodology, um, is one that I wrestle with repeatedly, and I know many other biographers, male and female, who also do as well. Um, d does anyone feel inspired to answer that? <laughs> no. no. Um, I, I think I can say, speaking for Deirdre and me, who uh, are part of a, another seminar on <laughs> women's yeah. biography, that we are very, um, very impressed at how the forms are changing, how voices are allowed to be heard, um, how, um, how, how dialogue, as you suggested it, really enters. I want to go now to the, um, the other question, also raised by Susan Quinn, the so-called ethical questions. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, everybody up to about 1960 that I knew was terribly secretive. <laughs> they never told you anything. They didn't tell you what they earned or what rent they paid or uh, <laughs> who they loved or whether they liked being married or whether they're children. They told you nothing. And uh, those who are old enough to remember those days know how hard that struggle is. And uh, those of us, again, in academia uh, work with men who would rather be stripped naked than tell you their salary. Um, we, we still live um, in that kind of world. Um, and I think one becomes aware of this, but I want to suggest here and ask for a few comments on um, the problem of the particularly secretive subject. I think the best example I know of this is Willa Cather. Mm -hmm. She burned everything she could get her hands on, and what she couldn't get her hands on, she got her friends and relations to burn. A few things remained. 
But um, Sharon O'Brien, who wrote that wonderful biography of Cather through the writing of O Pioneers, I think is rather worried about going on because there is, there is so little evidence. Uh, what that does, ironically enough, is cause one to make the whole thing up for oneself. <laughs> it causes one to question why was she being, what was she afraid of, uh, what was she fearing, what was her world, and in a sense we get a whole new kind of biography there, uh, and, and, and a whole new approach. And so I wanted um, to suggest how the degree to which ethical questions uh, entered the biographies you wrote. Uh, even if your subject is perfectly willing to have you talk about everything, your subject may have uh, friends and relations who are not, and obviously you have to honor that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought we might just discuss that problem with this new open discussion of orgasms and uh, everything else. Uh, uh, did, 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 you, did yeah. it affect you? Well, it affected me greatly, uh, and I, I had it brought <clears throat> home to me uh, when I was revising the biography of Samuel Beckett for republication just last year. This was before uh, Samuel Beckett died, that the editorial revision work was going on. And um, if, you, if you read that book now, the, the book was uh, originally published in 1978. If you read that book now, you can see that up to the moment of Waiting for Godot, the book that made him, uh, the play that made him very famous, um, I, I'm, I deal in great detail with the events of his life, uh, with his relationships, with his anxieties, his, uh, his own psychoanalysis, and uh, so on and so forth. And after Waiting for Godot, he himself became very secretive. It's as if he knew that he had moved center stage in the world. His letters changed. Letters to friends which had been rich and full and open suddenly became, so nice to have seen you, call again when you're in Paris, that sort of thing. Um, and I discovered uh, a number of relationships in the later years of his life um, that I thought that I would write about um, and then decided not to write about it because young people were involved, uh, children were involved, um, relationships were thrown into question. People would have been really hurt, and these were private people. So I didn't write that in the 1978 biography. And just um, in 1989, 1990, when I was revising the book, I thought about including some of it, if not all of it. I thought about bringing the life up to date from 1978 until 1989. And again, I withheld the information because um, research led me to ascertain that um, a number of lives in particular would have been very, very badly damaged. Uh, so I didn't write it. Uh, with Simone de Beauvoir, it was entirely different. My question was how much propriety do I want to keep, because this is the woman who told everything. She kept nothing back. She volunteered all of the information about her sexuality, about her human relationships, and so on, that is in my book. She had no qualms about having that presented. So they, those were two different people that I wrote about. Now I'm writing about Ana Is Nin, uh, just to give you an example, the published diaries. Um, the published diaries and the unpublished diaries uh, are as if you're reading two different lives of two different people. Um, she played fast and loose with gender, with sex, with occasion, with incident in the published version. Um, and not only she, but um, the persons who continued to work on the diaries after her death uh, did very much the same thing. And as I go through some of this material now, uh, I find myself saying, well, all of these men on this one occasion, uh, they were really women. And uh, some of them would not want uh, it to be known that they were there, that they were in this company. Um, what do I do about this? I haven't decided yet. These are questions that I'm thinking of. Um, what do I do about Nin taking an event that happened in New York and an event that happened at Big Sur and putting them together as if they happened at Acapulco. <laughs> um, there are people who shouldn't have been there. 
At least they tell me that now. Uh, <laughs> so these are some of the questions of privacy. These are some of the questions of ethics, different kinds, certainly. Um, I, I, people op will often say to me, well, what are you going to do when people write your biography? And I say jokingly, well, I'm going to burn everything. There isn't going to be anything left for anyone. And as a relatively private person, I have to tell you that it does bother me uh, writing about people's lives this way. And um, I, I have to go back to the main reason that I ever began to write biography in the first place, which was as a well-trained academic uh, scholar with a PhD from Columbia, I thought that I was opening up scholarship to new areas. I thought that I was going away from new criticism and that I was giving more information, more material to structuralists, deconstructionists, so on and so forth. And I thought that, and I still think that, for me, the writing of biography is a method of examining an individual whose life and work had a significant impact on the society in which he or she lived. And that basically, when I come to these thorny questions of sexuality, of human relationships, and so on, I, I have to go back to that and I have to hold on to it. I have to hold on to the fact that I do believe that I am writing scholarship and that's one of my primary intentions. I agree very much with that, but I think there are also uh, a lot of different, different types of areas in which ethical questions uh, arise. The ones of what are you willing to do, the ones of what would the subject, what mm -hmm. is or is not a violation of the privacy of the subject, or of other people involved uh, in their lives. And then just to, to complicate it one more, there's an additional domain that, that comes up if, if, for example, as uh, happened with me uh, over the biography of Anna Freud, you are involved with a profession, psychoanalysis, which has its own ethics and its own dedication to confidentiality and mm -hmm. the protection of confidentiality, and you have materials which, if you used them, would be a violation of other people's understanding of that profession and of its confidentiality, you have an obligation to the intactness of the confidentiality principle within psychoanalysis, I think, not mm -hmm. to use that material. And I made that decision any number of times uh, in this book with often to my regret <laughs> and want, wanting not to be doing what I was doing, I said no. I cannot write about this because I only know about it from within a description of an analytic situation which should not be part of the public domain. And the reason for, the, for that ultimately is that you don't, psychoanalysis has enough trouble as a profession without, without biographers making prospective patients feel that there's a third presence in the room and it's not their mother or their father. But, <laughs> but, but a biographer, for God's sake. I mean, this is this is, uh, this is really uh, no person no person who ever felt that they might be the object of anyone's attention would ever see a shrink under these uh, under these uh, conditions. So there's a kind of uh, obligation to to social relations that also can be uh, uh, involved. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm faced with a particularly thorny dilemma right now, working on the life of Marie Curie. Um, in 1912, around the same time that she was about to receive a second Nobel Prize, it was revealed in the press that she was having an affair with Paul Langevin. Um, what happened was that Paul, another great f French scientist, what happened was that Paul Langevin's unhappy wife went to the yellow press with the story. And it, it, it was a combination of both misogyny and xenophobia in this case. Marie Curie was portrayed as a foreign woman, as you know, she was Polish, who was uh, destroying a French household, un foyer français. And uh, it, was a, it was a great, great scandal in her life, one that is not even mentioned in her daughter's biography. In fact, it's probably the reason that her daughter wrote that biography <laughs> was to really preempt other biographies. Um, it was a, t a devastating, humiliating, painful experience in Marie Curie's life. Um, and I, I sincerely hope that the affair was fun because <laughs> what followed was not. 
<laughs> and uh, she lost a year of work. She was physically ill, mentally ill. Um, not well. She's de very depressed. Um, and and my she was a very private person. Um, and um, my question is a question of balance more than anything else. How do I keep this affair and the story of the affair from overwhelming the book uh, and from becoming uh, another form of, um, of the kind of uh, cruelty that she experienced at the time? Um, and yet, I have to deal with it. It's very, very important. Uh, it was a, a turning point in her life. Um, she would hate the fact that it was in a biography, and I know her daughter, who is still alive, will hate it also. This is another issue for me. Um, so um, another form of the question mm -hmm. and the problem. May I just add something? I, I know of several biographies in progress now in which uh, the biographers have been given psychiatric case records. Yeah. And uh, when I first heard this, I was horrified at this breach of confidentiality. But everyone is dead, and uh, ex the heirs of the persons in question want these records to be made public. Then again, the question is, what right have they to have their relatives' records made public, and so on. But here I am now writing about Anais Nin, who had any uh, number of uh, psychoanalyses, psychiatric experiences, and I find myself wanting access to those case records. I want to use them. Uh, I want to see what they said and what they contain. So I'm, I think I represent both sides of this dilemma. On the one side, the breach of professionalism, I don't like it, uh, the breach of the professional relationship. But on the other side, as the biographer, I feel that it's important for me to have access to these records in order to present uh, the person I'm writing about as fully and accurately as possible. I have to tell you, I don't have any of these records at this time, and it's unlikely that I ever will, but it is something that um, really I, I go back and forth. It's like a seesaw. Mm. Well, I can imagine conditions under which such material could be made available that, you, that would not raise ethical qualms for you, but it certainly is. Uh, uh, if, if the persons involved are not there to say yay or nay or no, no disposition of the papers has been, it's, it's a different matter. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think that we ought to, uh, to mention in all this what the point of writing these biographies <laughs> is. Uh, it's implied in everything we say, but I'd like to emphasize it again. I think the purpose of all these biographies ultimately are to open for women and men reading them understandings of life, of the difficulties of it, of its possibilities, and of the ability of past women, in this case, to triumph over what were often extremely difficult situations in an extremely unsympathetic world. Uh, it seems to me the main point about Marie Curie's love affair here is precisely how hurt she was by the publication, how she suffered, why she suffered, that way, uh, why women were in that position. So that in a sense, um, as, as you talk, Susan, of the damage it did to her, I think the picture of the world that, that inflicted that damage uh, is important. And perhaps a woman reading the book who has herself been afflicted in that way uh, will take a kind of courage or at least put more into proportion what has happened to her. I do want to mention, perhaps this is the last subject we might take up here, something that's come into the world since most of your subjects uh, flourished. Not, I suppose, uh, Deirdre's subjects, but, um, and that is the modern media world. Mm -hmm. The world of television. Uh, the, uh, we live in a world with two realities what happens if anybody can find it out, and what the media tells us happened, which is very often emphatically not the same thing. Mm. Uh, we live in a world where public figures are almost wholly powerless to prevent anything being said or thought and so forth. So that um, I think that's a new way we have to, um, we have to understand our subjects and, and what it is they're up against. Do any of you have any feeling about, uh, about that? 
Oh, you're the one who's writing the biography of the media subject. <laughs> yes, uh, I admit it. I, that's true, but I, um, I think there's a, there's a sense in which, and actually, believe it or not, that wasn't what I was thinking of. Um, I don't expect you to believe it. Uh, what, I was, uh, what I was really thinking of was the degree to which the four of us sitting here have also been, in a sense, made into media figures to some extent uh, that is quite different from, I think, the way uh, any of us really is. And in my case, in a very minor way, but nonetheless, there it is. One is at the mercy of those who, wants, who want to, um, to see one in a certain way. So we have a certain sympathy with our biographers. Mm. And I know Deirdre has written about this. She finds herself defending uh, Simone de Beauvoir <laughs> and so on. Uh, and. Um, I think that you, uh, Elizabeth, may have um, been questioned about Anna Freud in some mm. I found, unreasonable way. <laughs> I found one of the most uh, startling and painful uh, reviews of, that my Anna Freud uh, received was uh, in the New York Times. And uh, this, this review ended with uh, a suggestion that I had uh, failed to really be honest uh, about Anna Freud's uh, sexuality because I was homophobic. And I thought, oh, God, <laughs> give, me a, give me a break. <laughs> you know? This is really, you know, that I should have said uh, that she, or I should not have implied that her entire sexual life had been sublimated or that she was aesthetic, that I should have been more open to the possibility that she was homosexual. And I thought I had dealt with this very carefully <laughs> in the book and that had been very uh, straightforward uh, about her aestheticism and about the, the homoerotic nature of her relationships, though not homosexual in the, in the, in the technical, <laughs> in the technical physical uh, sense of that. And, to be, and then to be accused of having been uh, um, uh, fallen short about this because I was homophobic is exactly the kind of thing that I think makes, I mean, it made, it made my earlier experience with having, uh, having poor Hannah Arendt accused of being uh, a Nazi because she'd had a love affair with Martin Heidegger, which I had revealed in my book. Uh, this, and I, in another review, was accused of, be, of aiding and abetting her, her um, disguise of her, of her affinity for the Nazis. I mean, people say, the most outrageous things uh, uh, in reviews. They're really crazy, and they're very, they're very painful uh, uh, to read. And it makes, you, it makes you, I think, even, or it has this effect for me, even more uh, dedicated to the medium of the book for telling, a, for telling a person's life. A slow, careful, well-researched, non-television, non-docudrama approach to a person's life, which gives the reader also a slow, careful, footnoted, uh, backed up uh, approach to a life that they can at least have a feeling of trust about and not get caught up in this media nonsense that, that goes on about people's lives and about the lives of people who, who write people's lives. Do either of you have a... Well, I just say that that, that um, Marie Curie was the victim of a lot of media mm. nonsense. She was perhaps one of the most famous women of France in her time, and the newspapers never tired of doing profiles of Marie and Pierre Curie, and it was enormously painful to her. She was very shy. She was very serious about her work, and she resented, as she well might, being reduced to this kind of caricature. Uh, so she suffered with that a lot. In fact, their story, her daughter told me the story that when she was recognized, she hated to be recognized, and uh, one day she was walking across the bridge to work and someone saw her and said, uh, Madame Curie, and she turned and stared at him and she said, no, monsieur, you are mistaken, <laughs> and walked on. Um, Elizabeth, uh, this is sort of a, a fringe answer to the question, and. Um, Elizabeth raises the question about uh, the biographer responding to reviews. And a question that, I, that I've asked frequently uh, in groups of other biographers is, how do we review a biography? What do we say? What is important to put into a biography? All too frequently, I find, 
that reviews of biographies represent the reviewer's particular orientation, shtick, phobias, prejudices, or whatever. It's as if the biographer has to be punished for being the messenger who brings the bad news. Mm. It's as if a good review of a biography consists of um, the, the reviewer making you know something about himself or herself, and then a plot summary of what may or may not have gone on. So my question is, how do we review biographies? Do we talk about the language? Do we talk about the form? Um, do we talk about the way each biography may differ from previous biographies of the subject, should they exist? Uh, what, what, what is the kind of uh, information that should go into the review of a biography? I, I really believe, and this is a, a personal belief, I haven't done any research on this, but I think that um, reviews of biographies are probably the, re the worst uh, written or contain the worst kind of information of all the genres. Um, and think about it next Sunday when you pick up the New York Times, if there's a review of a biography, contrast that, say, with a review of a novel and see what kind of information you're getting about the book at hand. You can even go home and read this week's New York Times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think I'll, um, I'll turn now to uh, the questions um, from you. And the first one, I'm putting it first. It's addressed to me, but my interest is in hearing the response of the others on this question because it's a question dear to my heart. <laughs> and it says um, that I have said that many women achieve their goals or begin to achieve their goals late in life. And the question asked is, is this true of the subjects of the biographies uh, you uh, three are writing about or have written about? Should we go in alphabetical order again, <laughs> Deirdre? Yeah. Well, with Simone de Beauvoir, it was, of course, different. Uh, she herself described this uh, relatively late in her life when she said it never occurred to her that she was the victim of any kind of prejudice because all doors were always open to her and then she realized later in life when she became a feminist that these doors had always been open to her because she was the companion of Jean-Paul Sartre. And all the doors that she was interested in having open to her were open to her because she was his companion. So that uh, success came uh, relatively early to her, late 20s, and built and, and continued and remained throughout her life. With Anna Isnin, it's, it's, a, it's a story of struggle, 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 uh, until um, she was in her 50s. Um, I don't know that, that I would call that uh, a late age at this point in my life, but at any rate, <laughs> but at any rate um, she had struggled for, for most of what we would call her youth and her younger middle age to get people to publish what she was writing. So for her, yes, indeed, it was a struggle. With Colette, of course, there was the famous Willie whose role needs to be examined and reassessed and reevaluated at some length, and I hope to do this. Um, who pushed her uh, at a very young age to start writing. But the interesting thing about Colette is, of course, that she wrote all her life. She supported herself with one form of journalism or writing. Um, so I don't, I don't believe that I'm uh, probably the best person to answer uh, this question because the three women that I'm writing about and have written about, uh, it all happened differently for each of them. Well. I, I must say both of my subjects had early success. Uh, Karen Horn and I went to medical school and uh, uh, quickly became involved in psychoanalysis in Berlin, began writing those wonderful essays about female psychology in her 30s after she had her children, but uh, she was still a pretty young woman. And in Marie Curie's case, um, the discoveries came when she was very young. Uh, she was... Uh, um, let's see, um, 1898, she was, uh, she was, she was 31 when uh, she and Pierre discovered radium. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say in either case, does it apply for me? I don't know, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. I should have invited uh, someone else. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll help you. <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth? I think it's, it's always surprising to me to realize that uh, Hannah Arendt was 45 years old when she published her first major That's work, which was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> which was uh, the origins of uh, totalitarianism, and that the, the war had her exile and the war had completely interrupted uh, a career which might have which might have begun earlier and in many respects i think that postponement as it were by weltgeschichte as you <laughs> said of her uh, contributions was one of the both most painful and best things that could have happened to her because she came onto the scene with a mature work that made uh, a great deal of difference and also with Anna Freud, I think that it's true to say that Anna Freud's most deeply original, as opposed to most systematic or most uh, important to other psychoanalysts, contributions to psychoanalysis came when she was in her 70s. And uh, this is the, the late work on normality and pathology in childhood, the work which is most independent of her father's uh, influence and is most uh, departs most from him and I think that that that's uh, as it were no no coincidence that the f the further away from uh, him she got in years the easier it she found to think uh, to think freely mm -hmm. and also I think there was a kind of um, uh, this is something that that uh, you yourself have re have remarked uh, is common of of uh, uh, people, women to, in particular, but people in general in their old ages, that they are, uh, they don't fear saying things that are uh, uh, rebellious or uh, different or departing because uh, they've they've nothing they've nothing to lose in this in this uh, kind of sense. They can make a make a new beginning uh, on their own terms, uh, and uh, that's uh, certainly. Um, Profoundly important modeling for for those of us who are younger to to think uh, that uh, the 70s can be the decade of of great achievement. <laughs> there you <Yeah>. are. Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, this question, um, I think, um, leads to some of the confusion we've had. So I'll read this one: Could a feminist write a biography? Write. Um, about a man in this new feminist way. And then uh, the questioner goes on to say, given the lack of this material in most men's lives. <laughs> um, it's not lacking, it's there. You just have to know how to find it, <laughs> what questions to ask to perceive it. Uh, yes, I, th I, I think the answer to that question is definitely yes, that a woman can certainly write a biography of a man. I think she may be a little more aware than a man might be, or I should say might have been, about the man's attitudes toward women and their rights in the world. Let me say that the men writing biographies of women now are very aware, and I think it works the other way too. Uh, and um, do you have a comment on that, Susan? Well, I think the answer to that is yes, absolutely a woman can write a biography in this feminist way, shall we say, about a man. And um, if the private life, if there are some lives, some men's lives where there isn't much private life, where he had nothing to do with his children and he was never <laughs> home and so on, and a feminist writing about such a man, should she choose to, um, would, uh, would certainly comment on that and talk about it as an impoverishment or, yes, yeah. Elizabeth, did you? No. Um, I'm skipping over some of the questions because I think we've answered them uh, in, many of the, in, in many of the ways. Um, this one's directed to me, and I think I ought in honor to answer it. What are the benefits and limitations of writing a biography on a subject who's younger than you are? <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, of writing um, uh, the biography of a living woman who um, um, may, of course, have a whole other life ahead of her. The question of a living subject um, is, um, is one that I, um, I leapt into without too much thought and haven't um, quite decided what I think about. But its advantages are obvious. Uh, as Deirdre has said with Simone de Beauvoir, you can talk uh, to your subject. 
And you do learn a great deal that way. In the case of my subject, she is part of a movement and uh, a, revol a social revolution to which she was central and which interests me very much. And because not only she, but many other women younger than me, because everybody's younger than me, um, <laughs> took part in that revolution, I, I think that I have a rare opportunity to see something in a certain way from where I am and they are now. I think later people will certainly see it differently, but I think that, um, that such a study can, be, uh, can certainly be of value. I think to answer the question, honestly, I ought to rephrase it. Would I write the life of a woman younger than I was who was, let us say, a poet with no public um, persona at all? And there, uh, and no part of any movement, and the public largely didn't know her views on anything. I think I would, I would question that a bit more at any rate. Um, it is the, it's being part of this wonderful revolution, uh, and a revolution not only for women, uh, but for the dispossessed generally. Um, do any of you want to say anything about write, my writing a biography? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm younger than I am. No, you're all being discreet. Okay. Um, Uh, this uh, person writes, as a psychologist psychoanalyst, I often deal with women who have difficulty investing fully in creative original work, and I have these problems myself. Did the women you wrote about have these difficulties, and if so, how did they deal with them, and how do you all understand <laughs> such difficulties? Uh, mm -hmm. like... uh -huh. Go ahead. I'll go first. I come alphabetically. Um, <laughs> Thank <yes>. God. <laughs> I had to think. <laughs> you can always go back to your maiden name. <laughs> your birth uh, name, excuse me. I, I, I certainly had this problem with Simone de Beauvoir. Time after time, she would write such things as uh, in, in letters to Nelson Algren, she'd say, I'm so frustrated. I'm sitting here crying. I'm bursting, I'm so close to the end of the second sex and I need to finish it. But Sartre has been invited to write a screenplay and he needs me to help him, so I have to put my work aside. And so she would go all the way across France to help Sartre with his screenplay and when she'd get there, he had changed his mind and didn't need her to help him write it anyway. And this, this is only one version of what happened time after time in their relationship, her feeling that his work was more important than hers, that hers had to be put aside so that she could work on his. Uh, she defended this until the last breath she took in my presence, that she had done the right thing, that he was this great genius and his work was more important and so on. And it made me so angry and it upset me that when I had to deal with these incidences, these would be the days when I wrote what I called the passionate purple prose that was so angry uh, that I knew that it would, it would never see print, but I had to write it anyway to get it out of my system in order to then be able to go back and make some kind of objective response to it. And I thought about this, um, I thought about it a lot while I was writing the book and I thought about it um, in, I'm thinking about it increasingly now when people say to me, how can you possibly be writing two books at the same time? Well, I say, I was a university professor for so many years, and I taught courses, and I wrote book reviews, and I worked on my own work, and I graded students' papers. Um, and I find that this is what women do. This is the way women do work. Uh, women integrate real work into uh, what shall we call it? Shall we call it real life or just life, daily life? Um, and I think we're more used to this. I think we're, we're more able to do uh, this. We're more able to say, I have two hours to work on this project that interests me before I go back to the work uh, which I'm being paid to do, which allows me to work on the project that interests me. Um, I don't know about men. Men get up in the morning, uh, married, single, whatever their relationship, they get dressed and generally most men go to work and they have uh, an appendage, um, impedimenta, whatever we want to call it, wife, lover, uh, whatever, 
who helps them, who does their laundry, who cooks their meals, who frequently helps with research. If I read one more acknowledgement of thanks to the woman who typed this book. <laughs> so I, I just think that, that by, what shall we say, by um, cultural um, um, acclimatization, Women, uh, because I'm not going to say one is born a woman to do this, to paraphrase Simone de Beauvoir, but by some sort of cultural adjustment, women are better able to do it than men are. I don't know if that's a sexist generalization, but I do feel that way. Well, I'd say in the, both the uh, case of both women that I've uh, written about, work was, was the refuge, work was like home uh, and relationships were more difficult. When Karen Horney was a child, she lived in this very unhappy household with an absent father and a very unhappy mother. And the way she would get away from all of that uh, and from the need to always comfort and take care of her mother was to tell herself stories. And that became, in her wonderful journals, a, a, a process of introspection and of examining her life. And that kind of introspection became the grounding then for her psychoanalytic writings. And I sense in her, in all her writing, a kind of wonderful joy and abandon that um, she couldn't find necessarily other places. So I would say that the reverse was true for her. Uh, and she managed to do the work despite being being a, a mother and having children and she but she found she found household help she found what and then if that wasn't available she sometimes the the children all claim uh, just left you know left them behind I mean she was so determined about the work that uh, some of the other things some of the other tasks didn't necessarily get attended to so well so the work was was not the she was not blocked about work, and I would say that the same was was true of Marie Curie. Uh, in fact, uh, when she was a governess, after 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 she finished uh, high school, she had to go to work to earn money, and she worked as a governess, and um, had an, a, a a love relationship with one of the sons in the household, and uh, in fact, they planned to marry. But um, the, 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 the parents rejected her because she was a lowly governess. Um, and that, that hurt her deeply. And after that, um, she became more and more involved in reading chemistry books. She writes about reading her way alone through teaching herself chemistry, essentially, all alone in this house uh, in a, a small town north of Poland, a house that I saw a month ago, incidentally. Uh, so I would say in both cases that uh, the work wasn't blocked or inhibited. Mm. Yeah, I think this, the same is the case with, uh, with both of the women that I wrote about, Hannah Arendt and Anna Freud, with the additional uh, uh, thing that was true of both of them, is that both of these women in two quite different ways felt of themselves as subscribed to a cause. Uh, and Anna Freud's cause, uh, psychoanalysis, was, was her life. And everything that she did was part of this. I mean, there wasn't a time doing this and a time doing this and a time doing this. Everything got into the, was grist for the mill of psychoanalysis, uh, every detail of daily life. And you can always see her going over things all the time. Uh, with uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, there was no cause like psychoanalysis, but it is so clear that the experiences of being cast into exile and of the and of the and of the war and the Holocaust turned in her into a person whose passion to understand absolutely dominated uh, her life, and she she didn't. I don't think she read the newspaper like a common mortal. I mean, <laughs> the newspaper was always supplying political yeah. theory, and uh -huh. it was just going on. I once had breakfast with her, a very exciting occasion to be with her when she read the newspaper. Ach, mein God, look at this! And it would be you know, yeah. <laughs> a constant commentary on, uh, on the affairs of the world as is, is this going this way or going this way, and historicizing uh, life in a, in a way that was quite uh, fascinating. And that can be with, uh, with women who 
neither of mine had children of their own. Uh, uh, their mar- uh, Hannah Arendt's marriage, a very free-form affair. <laughs> Anna Freud, not married. Uh, this life was organized uh, for work. It wasn't a question of uh, a total, the total investment was there. Uh, I think probably all of these women are accomplished enough so that they're not very go- very helpful in, in, <laughs> in answering that question, except that obviously they all overcame enormous forces against accomplishing what they did accomplish. Uh, a number, I will end, a number of the questions have asked, um, asked the same question, which in a sense you've all answered, uh, but I'll, I'll end with it because I think you may be able to add something else um, uh, that, will, uh, that will interest us all. And that question in one form or another is how did you and why did you choose these subjects? Now to the extent that you've answered it already, perhaps you can go a little deeper and uh, come up with something. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, why don't we go in reverse order for once and let poor Deirdre think a minute. Um, I mean, the alphabet is, after all, uh, probably a patriarchal invention. Um, Elizabeth? We certainly wouldn't want to subscribe to any patriarchal convention, so I'll, so I'll go right away. <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, uh, this is a, this is a, I, I can't answer that question because uh, for the Anna Freud biography, the most recent one, I was I did not choose to write this book. I was chosen to write this book by the executor of the estate. I was asked if I wanted, but then of course I had to say yes or no, and uh, uh, it seemed to me uh, that it would be quite a fantastic uh, thing to write a biography, uh, a psychoanalytic biography of a, the founding father of psychoanalysis's psychoanalytic daughter, that this would be so wonderfully uh, uh, cross-referenced. Uh, and uh, I made this decision as I was lying on my analyst's couch. <laughs> And uh, I said that when I'd been asked uh, to, uh, to write this biography that I had immediately replied no, uh, and that the reason was that it would involve me in reading many too many more German letters and I couldn't face it. <laughs> but then I had thought again, and uh, I think that what was tapped into when I thought again was something that feminism has been very good about allowing us to have what was tapped into was my ambitions and uh, the historical excitement of such a task. I couldn't relate to the woman personally because I didn't even know anything about her work. (laughs) But I related to the historical possibility. And uh, that's a a form for ambition to make a contribution, a historical contribution uh, that uh, when I was raised as a good little girl uh, in, in the 1950s, you didn't think that way. You didn't think, well, I have a, a wonderful historical opportunity on my doorstep, and I will seize it by God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to answer the question one way, but that makes me decide to answer it another way. Because <laughs> uh, you made me realize something. Uh, certainly the choice of Marie Curie tapped into my ambition. Mm. And uh, I think one of the themes of her life is a kind of heroic theme. You know, when she first came to Paris, she, she uh, at a party, dressed as Polonia and was reprimanded by her father because he was very stern and thought it was not serious. But when she discovered the first element, she called it polonium, (laughs) which was a more acceptable way to be a hero in her father's eyes. Um, She came from a a country that was a non-country when she left it, with a deep sense of mission about that country and about what it meant to be Polish. 
And all her life, she acted in a kind of heroic manner. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, uh, for better or for, for worse, I'm attracted to that. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to be to take on this biography. <laughs> 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 because it means pulling together elements um, that are form formidable. One is the first 23 years of the life are Polish, which means dealing with the Polish language, the Polish culture, all of that. Then she comes to France, and you've got chemistry to deal with. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, it's a whole lot of elements that are to be pulled together. And then the further challenge is to take an idealized life and to try to make it into a real woman. Um, so all of those things uh, appealed to my ambition, I suppose. Uh, and I figured if I could do them, I would feel really good about it. Um, and I'll just add one small thing that I realized the other day. Marie Curie was somebody who was fascinated with the elements themselves, with playing with them, with, with understanding them, and it was the source of her discoveries. Um, it was both her triumph and ultimately her undoing, because she died of exposure to radioactivity. Um, but that fascination was a big theme in her life, and all her lab workers, whenever they would go anywhere, if they would go to Indochina, for instance, with the French army, they would write back about samples they'd found in the mountains. And she uh, had a, in the Curie Institute now, there's a glass cabinet full of this, her minerals that she kept and named and clearly treasured. Um, and I remember the other day that I had a rock collection as a girl, <laughs> and that I loved it. Uh, and I spent a lot of time looking at it, rearranging it, labeling. Uh, so that was, uh, the, the ways in which one is connected to one's subject are, are sometimes eerie. Mm. Uh, and that, that, that was kind of an eerie and interesting one. Mm. <laughs> well, I, I guess I, I have a really uh, very different answer from the, the two marvelous responses that I've just listened to. Um, I, w I had just finished taking my degree at Columbia University, and I had written a dissertation on Beckett, and it made me realize that the Beckett that I found in the work was not the Beckett that I was finding in the criticism about him. And I was thinking that I wanted to uh, write about him in a different way, and I kept thinking that I was opening up uh, the work to new approaches to criticism and new understanding by lay people. So what began as a critical book ended up as what I call an almost relentless chronology of the man's life. And I felt that I had to write the life in order to understand and explain the work. But this came to me throughout the writing of that life. And I remember saying to my dissertation advisor, the late John Underrecker, that I really felt compelled to go ahead and write this biography. And he looked at me aghast. He said, you're committing professional suicide. You're never going to get a job. You can't write a biography. There's no place for biography within the academy. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, maybe there's no place for me either, but this is the book that I really need to write. So it became a kind of mission for me as I wrote the book. And suddenly I discovered um, one year or so into the research that I had never really read very much biography. It wasn't a genre that I liked a lot or that I was comfortable with. And I thought, before I can begin to write one, I'd better educate myself by reading a lot of them. And so I did. I went back to uh, very earliest biographies up through uh, every biography that was then appearing as I wrote that book. So that book was sort of a a trial and error um, um, task on my part, putting together the, ma the man's life. Um, I've been very grateful in the years since it was published for the response. But after I wrote that book, I, I swore that I would never write another biography as long as I lived. We had literally, you know. We've all done that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't think of total immersion in another person's life, of the, the economic cost to my family because biographies really don't receive the kind of support from publishers that they should have or from foundations at that time as well. And I thought of the emotional uh, commitment that I had made to the, this book and um, the many, many years that went into it. And I just thought, I just can't do this again. I don't have the strength to do it. But something very curious happened, just as Elizabeth said, that 
people had invited her to write uh, other biographies, people then came to me and said, would you write this life or that life or the other? And none of them really had much appeal to me until I was asked to write about an American woman poet. And I went to see, uh, she was dead, I went to see her executors and they looked at me and I looked at them and it was hate at first sight. <laughs> And then when I began to read the woman's work, I realized that this work didn't interest me enough for me to spend a year on it, let alone the number of years that I knew would be required. But that triggered something in me, and it was that I wanted to write about a woman. I wanted to bite, write about a woman who had done significant work in her life, and because I'm uh, a literary scholar and my interest is literature, I wanted to write about a writer and because this time I'm speaking of now is late 70s, uh, early 80s, it seemed that most of the women that I knew were in some sort of transition with their sexuality, with their relationships, with their work, with their children. And I thought that I would find the perfect example of a woman who had made a success of everything. And so one day at lunch with an editor, having just said all of this to that editor, he said, well, let's throw out some names and see what we come up with. And we didn't come up with anybody <laughs> for a very, very long time until suddenly one of us said the name of Simone de Beauvoir. And it was, again, as maybe you've read in today's New York Times, Eureka, the light bulb went off. And I thought, here is the woman who wrote four volumes of autobiography about her own perfect relationship. Uh, obviously, she had a perfect relationship. <laughs> obviously, she did significant work. This is the woman that I want to write about. Um, OK, so I finished that book. And I have to tell you that, that I'm um, compelled now by the genre of biography, by the problems and the possibilities that it offers for the interpretation of life, of culture, and of society. And I'm particularly fascinated by the idea of a woman who wrote extensively about herself, as Simone de Beauvoir did. So you can see that the natural jump for me was to go to Anais Nin. Colette came about. Colette was one of those marvelously happy accidents. Um, I was sent to France to write a, a travel article on her uh, about uh, Burgundy and Paris and all the places where she lived. And so doing just a little bit of preliminary research about her so that I could make some intelligent remarks about her life and work as well as the places in which she lived, I discovered something that, that is the central core of the book that I'm writing, which is every biography of Colette seems to me to have bought into a myth of Colette. They, they continue to set forth the same hackneyed phrases, the same tired appraisals, the same analyses of life and work. I went to an open file in the Bibliothèque Nationale, and I found materials that were astonishing, that were totally different from anything that had ever been written about Colette. And these materials are available to anyone who chooses to look at them. And most of the biographers of Colette have referred to this file. Why didn't they use these materials? Why did they perpetrate the myth of Colette? Why did they buy into it? So that's sort of the point where I'm beginning with that book. So a travel article has led to another examination of culture and society, and I guess that's what I do. Thank you. <laughs> Those were wonderful answers. And um, I guess we're finished. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.